Let's go. Suprema. Suprema Roll Call. Suprema. Suprema Roll Call. Suprema. Suprema Roll Call. Suprema. Suprema Roll Call. It is Questlove. Yeah. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Erica Otto Depp is here. Yeah. Light E is going to get mad. Suprema. Suprema Roll Call. Suprema. My name is Fonte. Yeah. That's who I am. Yeah. Letting you know I too. Yeah. Have a cousin named Pam. Roll call. <laughs> Suprema. Suprema. Roll call. Suprema. Suprema. Roll call. My name is Sugar. Yeah. And this is my phone. Yeah. And if you're still living single. Yeah. I live alone. Roll call. Suprema. 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 Roll call. Suprema. Paid bill. Yeah. Now take it easy. Yeah. yeah. Might have drank. Yeah. A few martinis. Roll call. Suprema. Sup. Your Sup. turn, Erica. Suprema. Oh, my fault. Why you? Suprema. Not yet. Suprema. 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 Roll call. It's, it's like Ia. Yeah. And let's talk style. Yeah. TV couples. Yeah. It's Max and Kyle. Roll call. <laughs> Suprema. Sup. Sup. Suprema. Roll call. Suprema. Sup. Your turn. Suprema Roll Call. My name is Erica. Yeah. yeah. I'm the coolest. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. I don't hope I don't look too foolish. Roll call. <laughs> Suprema. Sup, 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 Suprema Roll Call. Suprema. Sup, sup, Suprema Roll Call. Suprema. Sup, sup, Suprema Roll Call. Suprema. Sup, sup, Suprema Roll Call. I had yes. to do that. Oh, that's we gotta have the dancing silhouette, like we gotta call me glass, man. Uh, yeah, we gotta get yeah, that was funky fresh. I feel very well. Thank you. <laughs> What's What's up? Fun fun fact, in, in doing the uh LL tour, whenever Latifah went on the road with us, the biggest resp- like bigger than any LL song, bigger than any song Living of the night. Single theme song. When we did live in single, that shit was like yeah. doing Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana. Yes. Yeah, I can believe it. Like, Dana thought I was lying to her when I said, yo, we need to do that twice. Yeah. Like, literally, <laughs> as soon as it came on, yeah. check it, check, check it out. Check. Whole crowd started. What? Yeah. All the way to, I'm glad I got my, my girl. girls. Yes. I love it. Come well, on. that's Absolutely. good to know. To take that to the well, bank. This is a new version of Quest Love Supreme, yes. which yeah. we are still in the room together, but we're doing a, a virtual episode. Um, Via satellite. We're Thank live you. in yeah. person. We're sort of live. Yeah, we're sort of, yeah. Yeah. In yeah. person, right? Yeah. Well, we're here together. Which <laughs> we I now- like it better than us being all on Zoom. This is still cool. I know, right? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, Wish you were um, here. Team Supreme, <laughs> how are we? Good, man. So Time. we're just, not, we're not going to act like- dream. We're not going to act like we- weren't doing this like three hours ago. Like, no. I'm just... Uh, yeah, nah. how, How's Holy life world. for you, uh, Bill? Fantastic. I had a good afternoon. Thank you for asking. <laughs> and then I, I took myself out to dinner and I feel fantastic. What did you have for dinner? Uh, uh, martinis. Uh, martinis and sea bass. It was great. Wait, did y'all eat together? I wish. Well, let me ask Fonte. How's it going? I'm did good, you, man. Did you have a by yourself date as well? You just... Um, nah, actually me, Carvo, and uh, Laia, we went and had some Mexican food for lunch. In New and York? It, yeah. Yo, how that turn out? This shit was banging. I was surprised. <laughs> Where'd you go? <laughs> um, the spot in the hotel, the um, Don, those Caminos, oh, those, those Caminos. Caminos. Yeah. To hear episodes in which we do not remote, but like in person, mm. all of your hotel culinary adventures, adventures sound awesome. Like I've yet to hear a bad review. And you have to have the Fonte experience in a restaurant. We were just talking about this earlier. There is experience with Fonte. He yeah. likes to recommend things. He suggests, you know, he's, he's really good at it. I'm a man of husk. I've been this size a long time, so <laughs> I don't get food wrong. Like, I, I, I know that. I know snacks. Speaking of which, I actually, you know, infamously, well, yeah, as a foodie, people will think that my culinary choices are very hoity-toity and whatever, up the, the way that I am me right now. However, Captain Crunch. No, dog. I, I, you know what I gave a chance for the first time and wasn't mad? I'm not mad at Chipotle. 
Chipotle is really good. Chipotle. Oh my god. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. I, I, Steve shaking his head. I, mean, I, I very much prefer Dos Toros if you're going to go that fast That's food Mexican. Yes, across it is. Yes, it is. Oh well, uh, well, across the nation, I yeah. can't do anything about that. But <laughs> wait, Dos Toros is a. I like Dos Toros' uh, steak much more than Chipotle, and that's what I normally get. Let's intro our, our oh, guest yeah. today. Oh yeah. So, you know, it, it's hard to say whether or not the the category that you fall into is just actress or character actress. Mm. However, oh, I will. Oh, the way the way she <laughs> looks like. In my opinion. I think you are an ace character actress because you often come when I don't expect you to show up in any film, no matter what you're in. And you really have the ability. Like, I get excited when, oh, damn, yeah. she's, she's in this. Right. Oh, it's going to yeah, be good. Yeah, yeah it's oh, going to yeah. be good. <laughs> no, for real. Like, I've, I've yet to have a casual response to, like, if she, if I'm unaware that she's part of it like i didn't realize that she was going to be mm. riz's mother and wu tang said that part right right that part yeah that, yeah, that that was, get out or whatever like where you yeah. just don't expect to see her yeah then uh, my ears prick up like a, a puppy like oh yeah she's <laughs> you know that sort of thing it automatically makes the movie more interesting oh thank you well first of all caroline in the in, in the oscar nominated american fiction american fiction yeah what was your last name in that i was Coraline in american Coraline, fiction yes Okay. But did you have a last name in that? Not that I know of. <laughs> I was just Coraline. Okay. Side question before I say your name. If given a character, are you allowed to give yourself a last name if it's not there in your bios? Are you allowed to make your character up if you're... Yes. I mean, I am, I'm able to do what I, I want as long as I don't put it in the lines or the I story. Get I get it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Also, uh, Barb Allen and Run the World, which uh, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, I enjoy. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. In, in, in the brand new uh, Apple series, uh, Swimming with Sharks, she's a uh, married Lockhart. And yep. no, no, no. You're in Shining Girls, right? You're Abby Shining Keegan. Girls. I was, that was Apple. Right. Exactly. I'm sorry. I'm getting my networks mixed up. But well, of course, I get uh, we, we would be remiss, of course, uh, mentioning the role in which at least she entered my life, even though I know you, you've you had a life of acting before then. But, of Ooh. course, as Cousin Pam on The Cosby Show. But <laughs> probably I will say that Maxine Shaw is one of the most loved characters, period. And yeah. Sure. To this day, I still wonder if her and Overton, not Overton, Kyle. Uh, Kyle. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yes, are, are making it. Like, are they, <laughs> they made out to this way. day? <laughs> yes, exactly. Erica Alexander. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. I'm very happy and proud to be with you all. Thank you, Chris. So where are you right now as we speak? Well, I'm zooming in on a Zoom from Vancouver because I'm filming for the Apple Plus series Invasion. I watched that. Wait, Damn. the second season. It's a uh, second season. Third season. Third season. Girl, oh, that's a good one. Oh, Erica, yeah. I'm killing it. Yeah. That's a good one. A lot yeah. of secrets on the set. <laughs> Simon Kinberg is the showrunner, and he uh, famously did a lot of, well, all of the X-Men movies and um, mm -hmm. Deadpool, I think, or Daredevil, one of them. Yeah, yeah he's pretty awesome. So you're going to be a recurring character? I am going to be a regular character but only on season three so you're in vancouver right now i am in vancouver and we are filming and it's uh, a big production it's a international global production they did mm -hmm. a lot of their filming the two previous years in um south africa morocco japan mm -hmm. england um and now they've kind of rested here in vancouver I see. How many how many weeks have you been there so far? Uh, I think I'm going on my fourth week. I just got here just after the NAACP Awards. You know, I often hear of, like, right now, I mean, Vancouver, of course, is an acting hub. Like, how often, as an actress, are you in Vancouver? Like, how regular are shows? And why, besides the tax reasons or whatever, like, visually, like, why is Vancouver the <laughs> designated, you Place. know, uh, yeah. I filmed here before in 2016. It was another sci-fi series. I forget the name of it, but 
I don't think there's any other reason besides the tax incentive to come up here. <laughs> no, it's actually quite beautiful, and it, it it can double for New York City or maybe a European street. It really okay. matters that it's got a lot of nondescript places, a lot of outdoor spaces, so they can do a lot of action here. They've got a really great amount of crew and talent up here. So I think the idea is, is that the uh, American dollar compared to the Canadian dollar also helps. So there's mm -hmm. all these factors. And it is very close to L.A. You fly here two and a half hours, you are here. Oh, I forgot the proximity. Oh, gotcha. That helps. Hey, by the way, are you familiar at all with La, La Casa Gelato? Have you heard no, of this place? No, it sounds delicious, though. La, La Casa Gelato is a, a place in Vancouver. They have 500 different types of ice cream flavors. Lord. Like, at, when you first walk in, literally, it's, it's the biggest ice cream parlor you've ever seen in your life. However, like, once you get in the middle, when you get past the regular chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, then you get into intricate things like cheddar cheese ice cream, basalmic vinegar ice cream, uh -uh. ghost pepper ice cream. It ain't always supposed to be ice cream. Fried yeah. chicken ice cream. That, like, that literally, sounds nasty. It sounds awful. Yeah, not nobody. Like no, 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 no. It's, 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 it's worth... It's worth it. Why y'all shaking your head? I take your word for it. I believe you. Gravy, I, 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 yeah. white gravy ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I take your word for it. Bro. <laughs> there is pickle flavor ice cream though. No, no, it, I highly recommend it for people to you know just to and, and you're saying do it once Vancouver. over. Vancouver, that's the point. It's in Vancouver, yeah. It it is. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's it's one of their like a a, a landmark spot in there, but for sure. Yeah, it, well, if I ever want. I have diarrhea and the dribbly shits. I will absolutely there drop it. There you go. Go there straight go. to that spot. That's the dribbly shits. Yeah. Dribbly shits. Yeah. Yeah. So am I the only one that's not lactose intolerant? Good for you, Amir. Yeah, that's great. But I feel like I, I, I can't be the only black person You're not that the indulges only, but it's in a rare ice thing. cream. Yeah, it's a rare thing. Oh, okay. Well, but P.S., yeah. I just like want to add to Y'all, uh, I'm suggesting Invasion because I got to imagine this show is like a super sci-fi show, but it's also like super emotional. Like, like <laughs> it's an amazing show. So I can not only imagine that it's pulling, taking all your energies and whatnot because, man. Well, you know, it's a very big cast. So yeah. a lot of that different stories are shifted to different people's shoulders at different times. Um, but what I imagine is that because... Simon Kinberg is such a heavy dude. They gave him the type of money that you need for it to command that kind of time. So he takes a lot of the time to film and it's a very thoughtful sci-fi exploration of what it is to be invaded. You know, um, so that's what you feel. I think you hear that sort of slow creep. And I, by the way, whenever you feel that in a film, it's because Usually, the production has more money. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Plain and simple. There you they go. They don't have to uh -huh. rush through plot and all the types of things that other people do. They can really just sort of linger on people's faces and allow people to perform and or emote. And that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. See, the way she said emote, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it clearly mm -hmm. tells me that acting like she's a serious she's a serious <laughs> actor. a thespian yes exactly yes so one one thing i do know about you and i never got to uh talk to you about um you're a philadelphian come on i always forget yeah and yeah she graduated Pardon? uh well I, I do know that when i first heard about you like it was a big deal in the newspapers like uh girls high alumni wow you went to girls high and, yeah. i did wow. Yes, and, and I went to George Washington High School for a year, and that's where Kevin Hart went. But I'm actually a wow. transplant. I'm from Arizona, and I came when I was in seventh grade, eighth grade, excuse me. So I went to Roosevelt and Leeds, too. Roosevelt was like going to a prison. Leeds was one step up. <laughs> from prison? <laughs> Half of yeah. It was Mount, one was more closer to Germantown, and that was, I think they closed that down. And then, of course, the other one was uh, more Mount Airy, and that was a lot nice. more, I don't know, better. Right. Uh, what part of Philadelphia were you from? Mount Airy. Oh, nice. You was East in Mount nice Airy. Part yes. of, nice part of town. See, when you're from West Philly, mm -hmm. I just think anything that's north of City Hall is just N-O-R-F. <laughs> North Philly, even if it's Mount Airy. So 
what was your beginnings in in the world of acting? Like, were you a freedom theater kid, or was this stuff in your school? Did you not want to go to creative and performing arts, or? Well, you know, I think we had a conversation, Amir, and I know you've had plenty of them, but you went to school with my little sister, Charlanda. Yes. He's yeah. the one who went to the School of the Arts right. that you did. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was discovered when I was 14 in the basement theater called New Freedom Theater. Freedom, and, Freedom Theater. Okay. Freedom Theater. It's closed. I talked to the councilman the other day. We got to get that back. That theater is wow. beautiful. Yeah. It is beautiful, but it's tucked in the middle of Temple University and surrounded by, I don't think, people who understand what it's... Um, Gentrification. What's going on with Howard University? I got you. Roger that. Roger that. So to I was discovered in a basement theater by a movie company, Merchant Ivory Film, independent oh, film, man. came to yeah. Philadelphia. They were looking for little girls, black and brown, to audition for this movie. And um, after nearly 12 to 13 auditions and four screen... Screen tests? Excuse me, oh, screen yeah. tests. Yeah, I was the one they chose when the smoke cleared. Wow. Okay. What happened at Freedom Theater? Like, because that was one of the places where I wanted to go. But instead, my parents put me in settlement music school. Oh. And my sister went to Freedom Theater. Like, it was like, okay, we're going to have her act and he's going to do music. But we would only pick her up afterwards. But I never knew, like, what happened in there. Like, what was, what would they teach you there? Well, Johnny Allen Jr., and his partner, um, they started it. And they started in the 60s. 60s famously were starting to try to train black children the way the Black Panthers did. That they knew that the schools that were primarily white weren't giving them any sense of themselves. And you had people like the great Nina Simone talking about young, gifted, and black. So that's mm -hmm. really what was going on there was some sort of idea that if you infused a child, with a strong sense of themselves, and you also gave them creative outlets, got them in touch with their body, discipline, voice, sound, body, all of those things, performance, speech, communication, that you could influence the rest of their life. And they proved their point, like a lot of the um, schools that were going around the country at the time, and New Freedom Theater is of that kind of tradition. How old were you when you started Freedom Theater? Like, at what age did you start? 14. I only went there for the six-week program. And uh -huh. then I also did, like, two summers of a play called Under Pressure, which was their resident production that they put on every year, every summer. Is the hope or, I guess, the goal of the school to draw people, notable people, to see the kids and have them work with someone notable? Or or is it just like we teach you the craft of acting and then you're out there in the world? Like, are they like, this is how you get an agent? Or this is how you, you know, this 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 commercial casting director is coming to our thing tonight. Like, is it any of those things involved? No, not when I was going. It might have changed. It really was about self-love, self-reverence power, black power, young, gifted, and black, a sense of yourself inside of a white world. How can you move through it? How do you stand? Lifting your head, your skin, making the children go home and get undressed and look at themselves in a mirror, all parts of themselves, the lower parts of themselves, having some kind of regard and respect for hygiene, the way you spoke, the way you stepped up, grammar, all of those things. It was really more like a boot camp for life mm -hmm. for black kids. Did you realize that immediately? Or is this like, in hindsight, like I hated going to, I, okay, I'm sorry. I did not hate going to settlement music school, <laughs> but I hated the homework assignments. However, I mm -hmm. now realize, whew, thank God I went to settlement music school. That saved my life. But you realize mm -hmm. that stuff like when you're way older. Did you realize that at the time or... Because even when we were doing those types of exercises at performing arts school, whatever, like we'd be in the back laughing like, you know, they, they'd want us to learn Elizabethan and <laughs> project with your voice. And, you know, and we're just like. <laughs> that settlement wasn't as black as 
freedom in that way, though. That's like a different experience, right? Right. That's true. I think my sister went to settlement, too, my baby sister. Yeah, how many siblings do you have? I'm one of six and fourth. There's two younger than me. There's Charlanda, who you know, and then there's Maisha, and I think she went to settlement. And all of you have dabbled in the arts? Yes, in some way. Um, although okay. my sister, he was a social worker there in Philadelphia, and my brother's a Philly cop. Oh, so your family really stayed in Philadelphia? Were you the yes, only one? Yes, they did. Okay. They did. But both my parents were orphans, so we didn't necessarily have a uh, place to be wherever we were was where we were at. Oh, wow. But I think you were talking about, did I recognize what it was doing then? Yes, they were very mm -hmm. overt. They kept, it was like a boot camp. It was like an officer and a gentleman. They were going mm -hmm. to make you understand the power of being black and blackness and more importantly, the power of self-love. And okay. we needed that because at the time I was going in there, the streets were a battleground. It was crack, yeah. incarceration, uh, young women were getting pregnant. It was really like some kind of weird pathology movie. And I think they couldn't be soft about it. They had to be overt. They didn't have the privilege to sit back and not act like they were trying to do. They were trying to radicalize you. And <laughs> I think that it worked. Well, when you said offers and a gentleman, I'm like, wait a minute. I just remember Louis Gossett Jr. Mm. making <laughs> Richard Gere cry in yeah. the right in the rain. I'm like, wait a minute. So yeah, a lot of people cried, but they were crying because it was like church. You get you got in there and you had real awakenings, and you reckoned with even though you might have thought a lot of people had a confidence and didn't have. I guess the fears that some children have, they all had that. We weren't allowed to be children in there. I think that they knew they were a different type of child and that they needed to break us down so we could be vulnerable. All right. Not me though, now, by the way, I'm a preacher's daughter. I came in already vulnerable. <laughs> I was scared of Philadelphia and, and the students. And um, I was- Wait, your dad was a totally preacher? different student. Yeah, Church of God in Christ, baby. What's your- Oh, wow, Wait. he was a Kojic, he was Kojic. For really? Sure. Oh, yeah. Where? Yeah. Where was the church? Well, my parents were coming out of New Mexico. My Carlsbad, Las Cruces. They were Bible students. They traveled around in the car. And that's why I spent the first 11 years of my life in a hotel called Starlight off of Route 66. Wow. That was where you lived? Yeah. Wow. What was... Wait, let's go back even further. I'm <laughs> starting at Freedom Theater. Now, I want to hear of you as a nomad. <laughs> what was that like? I was born in Arizona off Highway 66. But don't want to be associated with those cowboy hicks. Yeah, I got my Arizona song. <laughs> just like Beyonce got her. Texas Hold'em. That's right. But, you know, that's what made me different and a little bit, a lot of trepidation in Philadelphia because... They were so bombastic and forward. And I'm coming from Hopi, Navajo, Navajo Mestizo, Mexican, German Lutherans. And then there was my parents who were Kojic Baptist. And then my brother, my sorry, my father got discovered by the German Lutherans and they sent him to the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. And that was in Chestnut Hill. So he was gonna be, or is currently a preacher? He died at 52. Shortly after oh, he man. finished at the seminary, they sent him to Brooklyn in East New York to start his church, mostly Puerto Rican neighborhood. Most of those people had their churches for years. He maybe had four or five members, but by that time he was too sick to recover. He was born with a bad heart. They didn't think that he would live past 17. He did, he okay. was a miracle. And I think he lived long enough to deliver us to Philadelphia and that gave us a lot more choices. Were you expected to join the ministry? No. <laughs> no. Wait, you mean, no, you said that no very, uh, as a matter of fact, like what was the home environment like? Because most people of the cloth that I know, like it's a very strict environment and hearing that you're a preacher's kid, but also like you dabbled in the arts like it's almost like oil and water to me because most people that I know like try to keep their kids out of 
any joyous expression, like singing, dancing, anything that's deemed secular. So, well, that wasn't the case for us. My father was a boy preacher, so he didn't have a choice. Well, let me just put it to you like this. My story and my background or their origin story is very Southern Gothic. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get the feeling that these people are making these choices. They're making choices because that's what's in front of them. And if you look at the black tradition, a lot of those people were preachers. Around the end of Reconstruction, the people that they called in to ask about 40 acres of mule were pastors, they were clergymen. Other than that, you were either going to be a farmer, perhaps maybe a teacher, but in showbiz. And so that tradition of preachers kids becoming showbiz kids like Denzel and a lot of these people, because we saw performance our entire life. My mother sings, she plays the piano. She was trained as an opera singer and a uh, pianist. My father played the piano by ear and we got along and got over with the kindness of strangers because a lot of times they were performing for their food. They didn't just preach. They got in there and said, oh, and they and suddenly that could get you chicken and maybe some rent. It sounds like, I mean, just based on what you just told us in the last 10, 15 minutes, like your family sounds pretty miraculous. Like you kind of slid in there that both your parents were were orphans, mm -hmm. which is uh, miraculous. I, I mean, not, not even knowing their My adoption story. Twice. Wow. Mm. Wow. And them meet, coming together and meeting each other. So my question also was, were, did they also have this under layer of foundation to, for you to even know about Freedom Theater? Did they also give you this other layer of self-awareness, of blackness? Like that's a, but on top of going to this church that the Germans brought him, there's so many layers. Like, did you get that from them as well? Your activism and community and knowing about blackness and who you are? I would say the activism, yes. I think yeah. most black people that came from that era thought they were being hunted and they were haunted by whiteness. They were hunted literally by white people. And so you and always you had to assume that you had to find a place to be. It wasn't just like the green book. You had to choose where you were going to live. You had to choose the type of career that didn't make you a threat. And so that's why Preacher. you get people playing, being athletes. They're performing for white people. They're coming in front of them and they're offering their voice and their talents. And suddenly they may be a threat when they go outside that door, but inside that door, they have a certain type of privilege. And so I think that my mother, uh, who was twice orphaned, um, and she had an extraordinary um, background. She was raised by the richest couple in her town in Carlsbad. And that's why she had, she knew how to, Amir talks about enunciation, pronunciation. <laughs> It's very That's important where it comes from. That's where it comes from. But then, of course, being the child of a preacher, you know that everything <laughs> they do, you see, it's, it's all part and parcel. <laughs> but you're also coming from res respectability politics. Uh, they were yeah. the people who did not want to look dusty. You were coming out for plantations. You're talking about after Reconstruction. You're talking about all the things that Black people were seen as dirty and and um, unsophisticated and unlearned, they had to immediately establish their bona fide. And so begins the black bourgeois. There you go. Well, yeah. And then once they found out we had money, so begins the black middle class. Oh, And yeah. the race for labels. You saying that has already brought me back to 12 because there's a time where even if I wanted to go to the movies, I would have to put a suit on. Mm. And it's like, yeah. why do I have to put a suit on to see Jim Kelly and Black Belt Jones <laughs> and Silent Scream at the Capitol on 52nd? And they're, you know, their whole thing was like, well, yeah, it's respectability safe, politics, safe. but it's also like, if you have a suit on, you won't get shot. Safe, or, yeah, you're safe. Yeah. Right. But then I thought it made me a target to bullies. Like, why is he walking in with a suit on? Like, everyone else is casually dressed, but I'm... The one guy is sitting there, like, you know. Well, Mayor, you remember the a... voice choir of Harlem? Mm -hmm. That was yeah. the whole mix yeah. up there. there to put on suits. Suits. And that's how they went 
to school and it made them targets, but it also made them responsible for their behavior. They needed them to look a little different. I see. After the six weeks at, at Freedom Theater, like, what was your next move into, what brought you a step closer to your profession? Like, at what point were you like, okay, I wanna be an actress and pursue it seriously? I never accepted that I was an actress until maybe my late 30s or early 40s. So even with Cosby and Living Single, you didn't feel like you were a full-time actress? No. No. I would always go back to my trailer talking about I was going to write my comeback piece. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm skipping. Look, since you brought it up, let me skip. Yeah. So the last day of Living Single, or better yet, a week after Living Single, are you feeling like, do I go back to being a civilian, or do I, are you basically saying that was your mind state? Like, I'm not a full-time actress until I have the next stable job, or? Your life as an actor, just as a musician, is very porous. Nothing ever ends, nothing ever really begins. You can feel a little bit because people have rap parties and that helps you sort of put your mind around like it's done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you've probably been auditioning the whole time for other things, and I had been. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was dealing with a lot of heartbreak because there was a lot of, I guess, hierarchy as to who they would allow to work other jobs. And I wasn't that person. So on the I, cast, yeah. on, on the, the cast, cast yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And so I missed out on a lot of things, uh, roles that they would offer me, but I couldn't take because Fox wouldn't take it and they would have pushed my career forward. So mm. once I got out of there and I wasn't, it's like being five years in the same high school. You want to go, you're ready to go. And unless there's something keeping you there, um, some kind of overall goal you might have maybe you're really bonded with the cast it's really going well everybody sort of signs up to do it again but it was breaking down on its own mm, so uh, i didn't think about it at all like oh like i'm a civilian i've always been a civilian just one that people know and so i've been famous longer than i was not famous i in in philadelphia when mayor good calls you to the mayor's office and gives right. you the key to the city and a proclamation and kids start acting weird around you that never really paid attention to you. You see how celebrity warps things. So all I ever wanted to do was sort of return to a stable version of myself, but that wasn't possible. So I kind of accepted that that came with the territory. But I gotta say, once I got out of there, I thought I'm gonna be a producer and write because I've been trying to do that since the Cosby show. Oh, wow. And okay. the acting thing, I'm not just being kind of glib about it. I hadn't accepted that I was this actress. It's just something that I could always do. Mm. So I think as a musician or you understood that maybe in your core competency, you could always do it. You were good at it. You could sit down and play the piano. And people said, oh, you're good at it. But it didn't mean that you wanted to be a pianist. So with acting, I had to accept later on that I just didn't get chosen like, hey, you can act and here's a career that I did enjoy it and that I was an actress. And when I had that sort of come to Jesus moment, it was a because a hypnotist, a hypnotist put me under. Oh, wow. <laughs> and when I left the office, I started to sob because she said, Erica, you're an actress. And I go, I am an actress. And I had not really said that to myself. How do you feel now? I feel like I'm an artist and a creator. And I think that best sort of says about the activism, mm -hmm. the, the fact that I have bigger ambitions than any one production can fulfill. But I just love the idea of people who are creators and I like to learn. What's your dream project? The one that you need, that if you had a, a hundred million dollars, this is what I'm making. 
you know, I think there's room for a new Pink Panther, and I would love to do a character like that. I'm good at <laughs> physical comedy and I'm good at comedy, but I'm also dramatic. And I think if you look what Peter Sellers did, he was allowed to be a lot of different states of weirdness. I like the British sense of comedy and I would like to do something like that. All right. Let's manifest this. Yeah, it's coming. Let's, let's, manifest it. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> okay. So now back, back to your teens. What was the stage that you're like, okay, let's take this serious? Like, your first audition, what was that like? At 14 or just later on after that? How old were you when Pam came into... Full full disclosure, also, I kind of thought I was, like, maybe a decade and a half older than you. Like... What? That until this, <laughs> You look fucking awesome, by the way. <laughs> Thank but, you. Uh, yeah, for real. Like, in my mind, I thought, like, okay, well, you know, she's 80s kids, like, started, da da da. Because Cousin Pam wasn't the teenager that Cousin Pam was supposed to be. In my mind, I'm like, wait, I was, like, 20-something when the Cosby Show came in. She was definitely, like, 14, 15. Because I'm thinking of the special ed episode and all that stuff. So, mm. in my mind, you're way younger than me. So, I'm, like, trying to school you and use words like manifest. That's oh. hilarious. <laughs> so... <laughs> no, I was older playing younger than myself because of the hours, you know, that those things take. They try to oh. get kids that are older, teenagers that are gotcha. older, play younger. I was younger than Malcolm Jamal, but I actually think I'm older than Malcolm Jamal in real life. Right. So actually, I didn't audition for Cousin Pam. Um, that was your that was your first audition? But she didn't. No, she not she at didn't all audition for Cousin Pam. Oh, you Pam didn't? Okay. When I was 20 years old. Okay. Um, I I had been acting for since I was 14. I had gone around the world with the Royal Shakespeare Company. I did a nine-hour play called the Mahabharata. I what? did a uh, miniseries and a movie with Whoopi called The Long Walk Home. Wait, and, wait, 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 Long Walk Home. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Wait, wait. So I that's came. where that experience comes from. Okay, I see now. Yes, and I had done two or three plays at the public. One with Joseph Papp, his last play called The Forbidden City, Bill Gunn's last play. Oh, so man. I had done a lot of theater, which a lot of black people did. Um, if you look at Sam Jackson and all these cats, there were no TV and films to absorb that type of talent in. You had one or two things. And if you were lucky to be those one or two people, um, you maybe could catch lightning in the bottle. No one expected to have a career in film and television, certainly not a black woman. Yeah. So I um, was doing a play at the public. And the story goes, it, it was actually a play called The Forbidden City, Joseph Papp's last play that he directed, and the great right. Gloria Foster, he's the light-skinned woman yeah. in The Matrix. From, from The Matrix, says, yeah. Yeah, have a cookie, you'll the, feel uh, right as rain. Mm -hmm. That's the great Gloria Foster. And uh, her best friend is Camille Cosby. And what I was told, that Camille Cosby came to see the play and then went back to her husband, Bill Cosby, and said, you've got to see Gloria in this play and this little girl. The little girl she was talking about was me. He never saw the play, but I also hear that he liked to give his wife gifts, and I was a gift. I got a call one day, could you be at Mr. Cosby's house in about an hour? And I showed up just off of Park Avenue in the, in the Central Park, and um, he made a roll up for me right in front of my face. He said, so there's this girl, and her name is Pam, and she's the cousin of Claire, and that's how it went. And I said, thank you very much. And I was Cousin Pam. He must have loved that you were from Philly, too. It just loved all that. came together. Yeah. Call me hometown. And he really put a definition and, I don't know, kind of a premium around people who were self-made. And I think that's what he liked, that he saw me as being self-made and that I didn't need him. That's where, Those were his words. How intimidating was it to enter not only like an established institution, but I mean, by that point, it was such a well-oiled machine, and oftentimes in kind of the the folklore TV shows, like adding a new character that late in the game is often seen as a jump in the shark yes. moment. Yeah, Oscar the Brady Bunch or whatever. Yeah. Yes. Or, or, or yeah, Oliver. Oliver. The, wow. Oh, yeah. Why are you? I watched a lot I of TV. I thought that was closer yeah. to you right now. Okay. You mentioned Oliver yeah. from the Brady Bunch. 
Yeah. So, but how did it feel just coming into an already established well-oiled machine by that point? Well, I guess the difference is, is I'm not the star. I'm a featured character. I get to day trip. I get to drop in, add a little salt and pepper. Uh, but the flavor's there. And it's a new dish. It's got a lot of juicy, dark meat, you know, and so they're adding a different flavor. But they've had the criticism that the Cosby show was too inaccessible. The family was inaccessible because they were too upper class. So Cousin Pam came in from the other side of the tracks. Oh, you're supposed to be the street uh, element. <laughs> can you imagine? Did they want you to be more thugged out than you were? Or like, how did you? I think that his, if he had told that to his, the writer's room, they might have thought it. But you have to understand, the king of respectability politics right. back in the day was Bill Cosby. So he set us down, me, Caramel, and White, Al Payne, and gave us the speech, do not make me ashamed. Just like you get Ooh. at church, don't you go out there and act the fool. Uh, don't do yeah. all your head. Don't do you know any extra on it. And so we were told that we were we weren't going to do it, but it was sort of just saying, this is not that place. I have Mary McKeeba on the show. I have this mm. person on that, that show. This, Gillespie, yeah. We are the talented ten. Do as and I so, say. But Karen was Charmaine, so it. Oh, she must have had to she's constantly from like. Too. Yes. That's right. She went to Kappa. Yeah, so she must yep. have had to constantly weigh that that line because that's like that's Charmaine. Like, mm. Yeah, no, she didn't because they got her because she talked like that. I mean, they right. wanted oh. that flavor. <laughs> they didn't know what to do to cousin Pam, so they, it's like they gave me my own posse, wow. and that helped nice. take that was dope. the strain off the show. So I got it. I was I, I probably wasn't people's cup of tea, and I didn't really necessarily know what I was doing. I didn't think I was funny, but I also didn't think they wrote me funny, and I was confused a lot. By the time I got to living single, I understood the idea of acting to camera and having an audience. I had done okay. them separately, but to put them together was confusing. And then I got it. I'd asked Mr. Cockby, I said, who do I act to? And she, he said, um, the audience, because he's stand up. I asked the director, Ellen Gittleson. I said, who, who do I act? And she said, the camera. They were both right. So I had to get that type of timing in my head listen for the audience because they were my best they were the fourth character in the show yeah and then also if they couldn't see what i was doing because the light wasn't on the camera because the camera wasn't ready you had to hold and so there's this dance you're doing and it's t like timing it's like music and if you get did it you say dance you can be funny did you say dance? Because that makes me think of the Cousin Pam dance. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that's a thing, right? No. The Cousin Pam dance from the special ed episode? The special ed episode. When you oh start, my. when you do the, when you, what? That's a thing. <laughs> like, yeah. You did not know that. I didn't know it. Thank you for letting me know there was a dance. <laughs> it's, it's funny you said that because there was an episode of Arsenio in which De Niro, who rarely gives interviews, was basically explaining to Arsenio, I think it was right around the time when Goodfellas was coming out, so it was like 89, 90, whatever, and De Niro was ex explaining to him, like, basically, I'm not acting. He gave this whole thing about, like, if, if you, most actors will, you know, the mistake they make is they show emotion and all that stuff. And he's like, real life people don't show their emotions. They they hold back. So he was basically saying that because he holds back and is very dry in his delivery, that's what makes him the everyday Same, person. Yeah. Right. And that stuck with me a lot, even though like acting wasn't my my focus back then. But when he said that, I was like, oh, so acting Less is more. It's what you hold back. Mm -hmm. And I actually liked your role because I'd never seen someone of your character of your ilk not be a caricature because i think sometimes it's it's almost like uh the acting version of being a, 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 a gospel chops musician you know like every musician nowadays got to show off big. everything they do <laughs> like all, all the melisma. Yeah. melisma yes <laughs> you held back and then i saw an interview that you did and because you had 
Felicia Rashad's, uh, you know, like when she talks, like Felicia Rashad has that that chamomile. Mm -hmm. It's grace. Sort of, yeah. Grace, like, yeah. Just. When you spoke like that, I was like, oh, she's like a real actress, actress. And I was going to ask if you dabbled in Shakespeare, but you already told that to us. I actually like the fact that you were kind of nondescript in the Cosby show and that you weren't all the way, you know, Balls you could have been wall. JJ, yeah. right, you could have been JJ or Hillary from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, like a caricature. I, I don't know. That was my two well, cents. I appreciate so. that. I think what you're seeing is that I think somehow, even in a character, you have to express a level of authenticity. Yeah. And I'm from Arizona. So I don't have the idea of blackness as being a set of tropes that are like very big and large. Cause that's not what I saw. I saw black people be black, like American fiction, black. Mm -hmm. That's Just the idea is that yeah. we're printed, presented with a set of stereotypes that we don't even know that we're pushing. And black people are probably only people to have to have burden. We're always trying to balance yeah. mm -hmm. a version of ourselves and we don't even know where we end or begin anymore. But I do mm -hmm. say this about comedy. It is a full contact sport. And you have to give to receive. You have to embrace it. You have to channel it. You have to love it. You have to go out on a limb. You have to be bold. You can't be scared. You can be, you have to be curious. And that mm -hmm. allows you to be free in the moment and make improvisational choices. Because I'm not necessarily changing the line, but I am changing the inflection in the line the delivery of it the yeah. delivery so that said could you tell me if we're going to the social media uh term how it's going and how it ended or whatever mm -hmm. when you're given maxine shaw which you know as i said at the top of the show i believe that maxine's character is the anchor of that show mm -hmm. you know like for me latifah is the 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 I guess the straight man of 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 the yeah. clique, mm -hmm. and she's the Dorothy, <laughs> not mom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And both Kims have to sort of be the Blanche. colorful, Blanche. Yeah, Blanche. Yeah, the color, right? Yeah. Which really Rose, allowed yeah. you, I think, Elaine, to really like all of your punchlines were funnier and all, your physical comedy, and then your chemistry. Which at the time, I don't think you're going into this thing thinking like, okay, by season one, I'll be this character, and then we'll have our uh, sort of rapport with each other. Like, cause both of you two basically wrote each other to glory in, in my opinion. But how did you prepare for your role as Maxine Shaw on Living Single? I prepared for it my entire life before I got there. <laughs> and I took every little piece that I understood and put it in a role that nobody was paying attention to because I wasn't the star that Latifah or Kim Coles or Kim Fields was. I was actually fourth. I was the dark skinned person in there with mm -hmm. TC Carson mm -hmm. and they weren't looking at me. And I learned from the Cosby show, or at least I understood now, the dance of the camera, comedy, and the audience. And the audience, yeah. So I knew and you can see in the first year, we kind of pushed those stereotypes that got us the, the roles, the audition, like, girl, I got this to this. So it's a little amped up. Mm -hmm. But that's what you do to get the role. Otherwise, these people who are in executive, executive positions don't think you're doing anything if you come in and do something that's a little bit more laid back. We're not allowed that type of soft presence that a the lot of nuance, yeah. nuance, thank you, that other performers get. Black people have to come with it right away. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to think that I'm in there discovering and experimenting and it's not harming anybody as long as I deliver the show they want. But each time I got more information about what the audience liked about Max. And each time I wanted to deliver a version of her that was authentic to me, Erica, but that and that balanced the show because you have to be generous with comedy. The people who aren't, that's why they don't do so well. They're trying to get the line funny all the time and yeah. 
sometimes you're there to take the hit and sort of just look. Um, and it's not about you. It's about you just tossing around and you got to know. But I, I think nobody was looking. So that's what I was. I think people oftentimes when they see greatness or whatever, you take it for granted. Mm. Again, I always refer to watching Steph Curry play. Like, he's going to throw it in and you automatically know it's going in no matter what. So at one point, you just take for granted that, all right, yes, he and knows. He's pulling off some incredible shit. Right. Because he does it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Right. But then yeah. then it's like, okay, they always do that. But I don't think people really appreciate the fact that, first of all, it's six of you. And so I almost feel like, all right, so in jam session situations, especially when I'm paying with mm-hmm. musicians that aren't my my guys in the roots, I automatically have to go into, okay, this guy's overplaying, so let me dial it down a little bit so that it's not too overwhelming. Because my fear is that I always make the all-star game analogy that all-star games are very boring because everyone's on 100. So there's really no sense of drama, whatever. Like when everyone's at 100, to me, that's just as boring as everyone being amateurs. Yeah. Exactly. So how do you – but there's such a, a push and pull chemistry with the six of you when you're in scenes together. Like what do you credit that to, the, the writing of the show or – do you know to hold back sometimes and let Kim get her shine or whatever? And is it like a game of basketball in which you guys like instantly know like what the other character is going to do? Because there's even some moments on that show in which I'm like, I wonder if they rehearsed that ahead of time to get that timing right or that sort of thing. Like to me, it was effortless. So when did it gel for you? It gelled immediately. Everybody wow, saw it. Really? And you, and I think the right analogy is music. I think that if there was genius or maybe lightning in a bottle, it's because they recruited performers and other collaborators that have a penchant for an individualism. And, but they play well with others. There's soloists that play well with others. If you look at Latifah, Kim Coles, Kim Fields, you could all be soloists, but we understand the whole and you got to have your self-esteem has to be in check. You have to know what who you are. And I mm-hmm. think that we were at an age. I was twenty-three coming in, but we had done enough in life that we didn't yeah. have to win. We knew we would win if we all win, if we all won. So I I think that you want soloists who play well together, especially if they respect the ensemble, and and we did. Hey, you talked about being a brown skinned woman, a woman on the screen. I'm so curious for Maxine Shaw and this look. You know, I was just talking to somebody earlier and we were talking about your braids. And somebody was like, Did you know that Erica's braids were made out of yarn? I was like, Yeah, that's we used to do that back in the day, especially because hair costs more than yarn. But regardless, <laughs> I'm so curious how you were able to pull this off at 23 and you being fourth on the call sheet, this look. I came in with that look. Okay. Okay. I can assure you that no white person would have ever allowed me to come in with that look. <laughs> and it wasn't because the, the white thing has nothing to do with it. It's just that uh, she was a lawyer and they would have probably wanted her hair pressed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I came in like that because I had worked with Whoopi Goldberg. She played my mother on I knew the Long she Walk was your home. mother on, the- yes, I remember now. Mm-hmm. Yes, Sissy Spacek. Yes. And we carry with us all of us in the world, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Somebody imprints on you. So if you look at that hairdo, mm-hmm. it's Jumping Jack Flash. <gasps> yeah. Oh, wow. oh short bob. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Stop that and with the. Yeah. There you go. Uh, and I just I come from that uh, tour. I mean, actually, I just come from a series for ABC, and the producers asked me, but I shaved my hair, and I did. It was nothing. It was natural because my hair kept frizzing up and I didn't have a perm. And so they asked me to shave it off. I said I would, and I was growing it out. And I had a hairdresser in Brooklyn, Deborah Hair Bay, who does the in-ray locks. And she said, I know what, I can grow your hair out. And so if you see the whole back is shaved and she had it up to catch on the top, she said, I'll do a cool bob and you can do anything with this hair. And I just happened to walk in and audition with that hair and that's Maxine. And by the time you finished the show, it was gorgeously long and layered and uh, and yeah, no, no and it was a wig. 
Get the fuck. <laughs> That's right. Because what? I kept getting recognized and I and I couldn't go anywhere. So I said, you got to make a wig. So, yeah. So that was my uh, question earlier. You were talking about you could see the response from people. How did you know? I mean, because this is pre-social like media. Yeah. Like, how did you know, like, okay, this is really, is hitting? Like, it was instant. Word. We were on Sundays, and our lead-in was Martin, and we beat okay. our lead-in from then on. Mm. So mm. if you say beat less. the number one show, yeah. on, and, and I, I don't like to say black show, but you have a, yeah. have a cast of black people. <laughs> And you beat the show, they'd say the black show, the number one black show in America mm. for Lat Latins and um, blacks. You win. So that's what happened. Wow. I can't remember if they went because it did that help, Martin? I can't remember. The it was kind of messed up. They made a Thursday night. They put undercover, New York undercover, New York Martin, undercover. And they made, made like a black night and we were all insulted by it. Wait a minute. Hmm. So... Okay, because I was about to say, I always remember Living Single as a Thursday show. Too, it started as a Sunday show. It was a Sunday show. After Living Color, it that's right. No, no. It was. It was our lead-in was Martin, then was Living Single. And, and then in Living Color. Living, Living Color, Color was, was on a... I don't know if they were on another... It was probably Fox, off Fox, by the, Fox. It was Fox. Fox. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, they were on Fox. No, no, no. Oh, you were Fox? Well, yeah, yeah. Were Fox. Yes, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then they decided, let's put them all on the same night. And that was Black Night Thursday. Then they flipped Living Single to first. We became Martin's lead-in. Gotcha. Wow. That's what Damon Wayans was fighting. Remember that? Oh. When they tried to do that to him and said, I think. Or somebody. I, can't remember. I did not know that. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Sugar Steve from Questlove Supreme. We are so sorry to do this, but we're ending part one right there. Please come back this Friday or check your podcast feed for part two with the incredible Erica Alexander. In that interview, Erica speaks about working on Get Out, American fiction, and her role as Riza and Divine's mother on Wu-Tang in American Saga. See you soon. See you soon. See you soon. See you soon.